What is good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Bird Flock Podcast. As you guys can see, anyone watching on YouTube, we have a very special guest today. Quarterback from your Grey Cup champion, Montreal Alouettes, Cody Fajardo. Cody, how we doing? Uh, doing great. You know, that sounds great every single time it's said. Uh, and like I told you guys before this, offseason has been awesome because... Uh, anytime you win the last game of the season, usually you got that added motivation. Um, I've been reaching out to a lot of the guys and I said, look, this year's going to be a little bit different. Last year we were the hunters. This year we'll be the hunted, right? We'll have that uh, arrow on our back. And uh, I think this team's ready for that opportunity. And, and I know guys are really excited. The off season has been I, as a fan of the team, uh, you know, I don't get all the inside scoop and everyone thinks I know things before everybody else does. I see the signings the same way you guys did, unless a player reaches out to me prior. So uh, it, it's always exciting time for me. And 365 days ago th at this time was uh, probably one of the toughest times of my career um, going into free agency. And so to be out of the drama, and just to know I'm locked up for two more years is, is pretty exciting. For sure. Speaking of 365 days, guys, this is day 365 days, day 365 of the Bird Flock podcast. One year ago today, we released our first ever episode. Um, but more importantly, Cody, 68 days ago, um, you guys won the Great Cup in Hamilton. How have the last two months <laughs> been for you? Has it been nonstop hectic hecticness? I know you've gone back to you know, your old school a few times and, and done some stuff there. How has the last few months been? Yeah, you know, it's funny. When you win a championship, everybody wants to feel <laughs> part of the championship. So yeah. um, there's been a lot of people that reach out, a lot of people that uh, ask me to do things and come and speak to their sports group or, you know, I'm a big part of FCA, speaking to FCA. And what's so cool about winning a championship is it just kind of adds to my story and, and everything that happened last year or the year before in Sask and then going and winning a great cup. Like it just gives me a powerful message. And so I'm able to relate it to student athletes a little bit easier. Uh, people can hear my story and hopefully kind of be encouraged by it, motivated by it. Uh, and that's just been God's plan. You guys know me, I'm a religious guy and God's plan was to throw me in the lion's den and, and see if I'd continue to worship him and, I did. And, and sure enough, he pulled me out and uh, let me hoist that great cup over my head for the first time as a starter. And so uh, it's been a great off season. It's been one of those things that uh, I'll remember the rest of my life and very movie like. But, you know, when the calendar flipped over to January one, I said, OK, it's the 2024 season. The past is the past. And we're looking to repeat. We're looking for the grind for nine. Uh, which Coach Moss has been really adamant about over this course of the offseason. And so that's what's got me excited is the opportunity ahead to not only winning that great cup 68 days ago, but also being a repeat team. You know, it's very few that teams get to repeat, and that's our goal this year. Yeah, and, and you just touched on him, Coach Moss. I wanted to get into it. Um, he's kind of been one of the cons consistents in your career um, going back to Saskatchewan the last couple of years. So Obviously, you two both coming into Montreal together, I guess. A big prove it year for both of you. How much did it mean and how special was it to win it with him? It was uh, it was incredible. And, and both of us, you know, I, I speak about my story a lot and how tough it was. But also him, you know, he went through some tough times in Sask and then getting fired and not knowing if he was going to coach. You know, I remember having those uh, conversations with him uh, at the end of the year in, in 2022. And he's just like, look, I don't know if I'm going to even want to coach. It's kind of taken a lot away from me. And there was some scuttlebutt about him taking the Montreal job just because of him and Danny's relationship. And so I said, look, hey, Coach Moss, if you ever take a coaching job, I would love to play for you and have an opportunity just to compete to be your starting quarterback. And so it's just crazy how things work out. And we had a very emotional meeting uh, when this exit interview after the Great Cup and just kind of expressed our, our love for each other. And we kind of weathered the storm together and to see where we're at now. And the work's not done. And, and that's the one, I think the biggest thing that we had through that meeting was just kind of talking about, hey, look, it's not over just because we win a Great Cup. Like we don't fold things in. Now we're expected to win the Great Cup. And so things are going to be a little bit tougher moving forward. But uh, me and Coach Moss, we, we like the tough situations. And so he's been a huge part of my career and my success. But I, I think I can't talk about Coach Moss without talking about Coach Calvillo as well. Because I think that recipe of those two guys 
being brought the best out of me and was able to get me to where I needed to be. You know, Coach Moss and I had such a great relationship, um, but being in Coach AC's office every morning at 6 a.m., watching film, talking through plays, and then hearing it with Coach Moss, you know, an hour later after he's done all of his game planning and stuff, um, learning from two legends like that really catapulted me this year. And I felt like I was playing my best ball at the end of the year because of that constant discipline of showing up every single day and having those guys continue to coach me. 100%. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. I mean, six or seven minutes into the episode here, I think everyone listening is on the edge of their seat saying, talk about the great cup, talk about the great cup, talk about the great cup. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give them a little bit of what they want, but um, I think the, the last drive of that game kind of outshines the entire magical playoff run that that was obviously, you know, Shana and I being the, the Hamilton haters that we are, we expected the win and <laughs> against Hamilton uh, in the East semis, but um, coming up against what is arguably st and statistically one of the best teams in CFL history in the, in the Argos um, in that East final, what was kind of the magic formula heading into that game? Was it game plan specific? Was it just the uh, desire to prove people wrong? What was the, the, the big magic formula for that game? Um, I think it was statistics. Uh, it's very hard to beat a team uh, four times in a year. And, and I, it's funny I say that because we beat Hamilton, I believe, five times if you count the preseason the week before, right? It was like, I think, our fifth time beating them. So uh, on the opposite side, I was like, well, it's very hard. We know how hard it was to take down Hamilton in the East Semi. And so we're like, okay, it's going to be very difficult for Toronto. Now, the thing about that game, you go in with a game plan always, and then the game kind of dictates what happens to your game plan throughout the course of the game. And with Dequa, a pick six on the opening drive – really changes the way that you think offensively and then having nine turnovers. So in that game, you know, every time I took the field, it was end each drive with a kick. It doesn't matter if it's a punt, a field goal, an extra point, end a drive with a kick and we'll win this football game. Do not turn the ball over. Do not give them an opportunity. And so as a quarterback, people think like, oh, well, you guys' offense didn't do anything. Well, I think we did everything we needed to do to win that game. We did not try to put the ball in harm's way. We tried to stay on the field, milk the clock, and allow our defense to go out there well-rested and could continue to put pressure on them. So certain games dictate one side of the ball needs to carry the other side, and that was one of those games where our defense carried us, uh, and, and rightfully so, and same with our special teams. And as an offense, we go out there. I think we had one, uh, two offensive touchdowns, which was plenty in a playoff off game uh, to be able to have an opportunity to win the football game and so it was really exciting to see that and going into the Grey Cup after that game it was uh, one of those things because of the way the game played out and everybody was talking about our defense and our special teams rightfully so uh, I think our offense kind of took to that as motivation like okay you you don't expect us to do anything that takes all the pressure off us in the world and the biggest game of, of my career and a lot of these guys careers you're taking all the pressure off of us by writing the narrative that our defense needs to score our special teams needs to score and so that allowed us offensively to go in there play loose and I thought we put together our best offensive performance in the biggest game and so that that goes to speak to the character of the offensive guys in that room that never questioned never got upset because they weren't getting the ball or weren't scoring touchdowns it was we were all in it to win football games and when you have a locker room right like that you have a very good opportunity to winning a great cup Absolutely. Yeah. And then obviously following that game, there was, you know, the, what I imagine was either the shortest week of your life or the longest week of your life leading up to the Grey Cup. Um, obviously had the, the, the fuck you just watch heard around the world, but <laughs> what was, what was the rest of that week? Like, was it all business? Was it, let's try to stay as loose and, and fun as possible. What was that, that week leading up to the Grey Cup? Like, yeah, you know, something I did that I'm very thankful for, and, and I've been very blessed of playing with some talented quarterbacks and I the first thing I did when we clinched uh it was when we were flying back from Toronto once we clinched into the Grey Cup uh I reached out to Ricky I reached out to Travis Lule, two guys that I uh respect a lot in this league two guys that have won Grey Cups and I said look just shoot me straight what do I need to do for this week and the amount of information and the things that they gave me helped me 
throughout the week because the week is pan pandemonium with the media, the coverage, the fans, like it is just chaotic and you can get so caught up in those things and then you lose sight of what you're actually there for is to win a football game. And so they helped me out tremendously with my routine and what I should do, waking up, making sure I'm doing certain things, just the smallest things like food. Like you rarely get to eat because you're going from practice to media to these spots. And so they were just like, make sure you're packing things and I don't want to give away all their secrets to the to the pie. But um, it helped me throughout the week. And, and it's funny you mentioned it. It was a long week slash short week. I feel like the first three days was so long. And then when we got to like the day before and the day of the game, it just like, bang, blink of an eye. We're, here we are uh, running out for the opening kickoff. And so it was something... Uh, like I said earlier, like I'll remember for the rest of my life and having my family there and having my son there uh, are things that, uh, you know, you don't get an opportunity like that. And, and Christian Matt spoke to it. Uh, you know, he went to a great cup his first year and, and we just re-signed him, which I'm super pumped about. And he's going on his 14th year. Right. And so 13 or 12 years later, he's in his second great cup. And you think in a nine team league, it's going to come, you know, every couple of years, it doesn't, you have to put the work in and then the game will reward you. And uh, this team was rewarded for the way that we handled ourselves, the way we respected the game, and more importantly, the way we respected each other. Yeah, now obviously going into the <laughs> details of the last game, we're going to talk about that last magical drive, obviously. That's like that, probably what everybody wants, wants to know about. Um, we're going to break it up into a few different parts here. Uh, so the first question being, uh, you know, you're going in, into the huddle for the first play of that drive. What's going through your mind when you're getting the chance to, to lead the team back? Yeah, there was almost a sense of calmness over me. And I remember taking the field and it was kind of weird the way my mind was working. The two things that jumped in my mind right away were the two West final losses to Winnipeg, one hitting the crossbar and the other one uh, incomplete pass where we were in striking distance on both of those. And so in my head, as I was jogging out, I was thinking about those and I kind of just thought quickly and I said, well, third time's got to be a charm. And after I said that to myself, it kind of just relaxed me. Coach Moss's opening play call was perfect because it was a quick pass to Tyson Philpot. The hardest part about a, a last minute drive or a three minute drive in any uh, football league is that first completion. You want to get that first first down to feel like, OK, our offense is moving, put some doubt in the defense's mind. So threw a quick one out to, to Tyson. He, I think he gets eight or nine. And then um, my man, uh, Caleb Evans, comes in, sneaks it for about five. Uh, and then we come back and we throw another quick one uh, to Tyson. He gets another first down. And then it's like, OK, we're feeling it. You know, the only thing about that drive that I was like kind of felt a little bit weird or upset about was they pulled me out for that short yardage. And anytime you're in like a final drive, like I didn't want to come out of the game. And then you stand on the sideline for play and then you come back and it feels like a whole new drive. So that was kind of weird. But the way that Caleb Evans has been in short yardage all year for us, uh, and he didn't just get a yard, he got five yards, which is a lot in terms of that final drive. Um, so that's kind of the beginning. And I'm sure you guys got questions about other things. I don't want to get into it too much, but um, just going into that huddle, uh, there was a sense of calmness after I told myself, hey, third time's a charm against the Winnipeg team. And then having that first offensive play call where it was like, I didn't have to read anything. All I do is catch the ball and throw it to Tyson Philpot and just don't yank the throw. And there you get a little bit of confidence going. And so that, that was awesome on Coach Moss and AC's part of just kind of getting me back into a rhythm and feel confident into that. Yeah, I mean, and then you, you kind of jump into, you get the ball around midfield after that. Um, <laughs> And you mentioned the calmness that kind of set over you. Did that calmness go away a little bit after that first down sack? <laughs> it was very interesting because uh, we called a quick game. So, and I just remember I couldn't see the corner clearly. And I was like, I'm not going to throw a ball and end this game on an interception. I'll take a sack and we ha we'll have two downs to get basically whatever it is. Um, so that was not on our offensive line. It was totally on me. I just didn't feel comfortable ripping the football. It's a quick game. They expect the ball to be out of your hand. Uh, and I held on to it. And so that one, I was very frustrated with myself. Um, but I, I also, when I got up, I looked at the guys in the huddle and nobody was kind of like hanging their head or was sad or like, oh, the game's over. Like everybody was like, hey, it's second and long. We got two downs to get this. Let's go. And there was this like sense of positivity that pulled me out of it because something I made a huge mistake on by not just letting it rip or throwing it away. Uh, these guys had my back and they're like, no, we got two more downs to get this first down. And it like, bang, pulled me out of it so quickly. Uh, and then the next play, 
uh, we called kind of a shot play. And Willie Jefferson, one of the best defensive ends in the league, has a great inside rush move. Luckily, he's 6'9", 6'10", however tall he is. I call him the Christmas tree. Luckily, he's that big because I could see a huge body presence in front of me. I was fortunate enough to get out. And something I felt like I didn't do the first drive, if you go back to the first drive of the Great Cup, I rolled to my right and I tried to throw a ball to Tyson. uh, And it was almost picked off as opposed to if I would have ran, I probably would have got the first down. And I was beating myself up about that. I was like, use your legs. Something I was doing so well in the playoffs was using my legs. And so on that last drive, kind of one of those things was, don't be afraid to use your legs. Don't be afraid to use your legs. And uh, I remember in the headset before, um, it was second and 15 or whatever it was, or 18. And Coach Moss said, look, do whatever you can to get us to third and manageable. He's like, in, in my headset. And I was like, okay, that means use my legs, throw a check down. I uh, don't have to get it all back in one. And so uh, I was able to scramble around make a play and, and get it to third manageable. Yeah. When you had to take off there, was there, did, did you feel any pressure or you, do you just feel like a kid playing football again, trying <laughs> to make a guy miss? Yeah. Backyard football. It's, yeah. That's what's fun about when you escape the pocket like that. It's almost like backyard football, but I do remember I was running upfield and I saw their free safety and then I went like laterally and it, it didn't work for me earlier in the year going laterally, but I was able to go to laterally and then get back upfield. And I got another like five or six yards doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have no juke moves and <laughs> neither does Josh Allen. So it kind of helps me watching him. Everyone talks about that fake slide, but I think that was just him trying to juke. Uh, so I, I try to do what I can by, uh, you know, running the snake method. And, and it worked, uh, fortunately for us, to, to get us in that third and manageable. Yeah, so you got to the third and manageable. And then obviously what happened, the last, the next two plays were kind of heard, heard around the country. Um, <laughs> you, you went there in third and five and you threw up, you, you know, you threw it up to Cole Speaker. And I don't know if for you, but for me, that ball felt like it was up in the air for 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I don't know how you felt, but um, uh, was that like a particular route combo? Was that called in your head? Was that to go to Speaker or was it more to go to the under route and you just said, screw it, we're going, we're going for it all right now? Yeah, you know, you say 30 seconds, I say 30 minutes. That ball hung up there forever. Um, So we talked about that play about two or three series prior to that final series. And I I talked to Coach Moss and I was like, I feel like their field field corner is very aggressive. And if we put Austin Mack in the slot, it's going to have his eyes down. And so third and five, that ball is supposed to go to Austin Mack unless the corner is aggressive, which in the back of my mind, I just felt like I'm just going to read this one out. Because usually in a quick game like that, you catch, you throw. And so if you go back and watch the tape, I changed my footwork a little bit to buy a little bit extra time to see what that corner did. Sure enough, he bites just enough. And, uh, you know, when, when Coach Moss called that play, I said, all right, if we're going to go down, we're going to go down swinging. And he has a lot of stones for calling that play. And uh, and I know a lot of people said, I have a lot of stones for throwing it. And one of the things I'm probably most fortunate about in that play call is not throwing the perfect ball there. Because if I do throw a perfect ball, we score, and there's a lot of time left for Winnipeg to possibly go down and score. So I left it a little short, and uh, I told Cole Speaker after the game, I said, I don't think I've ever seen anybody jump up and moss somebody with a body catch. Usually you see guys catch over their head. He goes up, pins it to his chest, and I'm like, man, you felt like you were 10 feet in the air the way you jumped up and made that play. And so, you know, just to speak on Cole, uh, it it's, was truly incredible having a guy like that who – I think he had one catch going into the Grey Cup game uh, in that playoff run. And here he has a huge touchdown catch. He had an earlier uh, quick game that got us into second and manageable. And then he has that third and five that was kind of heard around the world. So a guy that just didn't beg for the ball on the sideline, just did his job every single time and was ready when the ball came his way. And and that's all I can tell, you know, these younger receivers is like, you're not going to get the ball 10 times a game. Some games you might, some games you're not, but that one time we might need you in the fourth quarter with the game on the line in the Great Cup. You better be ready to make a play. And Cole did that, and and he made me look a lot better than uh, what that ball was. And then, like you said, you didn't want to leave too much time on on the on the clock, but you didn't waste much time after that. Uh, actually, didn't waste any time after that. You went to the end zone with an absolute dime to Tyson Philpott, uh for whatever what happened to be the game winning touchdown. So, kind of take us through. Uh, the play design, the decision for you to make that throw to to seal the game kind of right there and just the way that you were feeling when you broke the huddle. 
And before yeah, you answer, it, I'm just going to let you know that this play made me cry. So <laughs> <laughs> it made a lot of people cry, including my family, myself. You know, when I watch it to this day, it's like it makes me emotional. And my wife, it's funny. Anytime she sees anything Great Cup related, she shows me her arm and she's like, look, look, I got goosebumps, you know, and it just you do. it means so much not only to the players, but also the families. Right. And the, my wife, who talked me into coming back and playing football and who did everything she could to allow me to play football this year. And, and then it's all worth it in the end. Right. So, um, but talking about that play, this is where I, I tell young quarterbacks, um, film study is so dang important because I knew Winnipeg probably better than any other quarterback, just from facing him over the years, as many times as I had. And anytime you had a big play on Winnipeg or you were in the red zone, they would bring their all out pressure. And so in the back of my mind, I knew I need to know what my hot is. And Tyson Philpott was our hot on that post route backside. But what we were really trying to get to was a post corner route to Sneed on the other side, because earlier in the game, we threw a post route um, to um, Austin Mack and I threw a pick. The way that their halfback was playing, he was really good at covering the post. When guys went to the post, he was really good. And so we felt like if we get him on a post corner, he would overcommit. And if you go back and look at the film, Snead always gives me crap for it because he's like, I was open too. I could have been a great cup hero too. Uh, but the way our reads go is if they bring more than we can protect, we have to throw the quicker route. So I couldn't wait on Snead to do his post corner route. So uh, Tyson runs his best post route. And we talk about in cover zero, what you have to do, you have to attack leverage because the DB is going to be lined up inside. And if he just ran vertical right there, DB stays inside it's probably a pick or an incompletion, and then we got to kick a field goal to tie and go into overtime. But he attacks leverage, gains leverage, crosses the face, uh, and I didn't get to see the throw. I kind of threw it, and I listened to the roar of the crowd. I, I just There was a lot of trash in front of me because they brought a lot of pressure, and I hear the roar of the crowd, and I look up, and I see Phil Pot on the ground, and I'm like, did he juggle it? drop it, what happened? And then I see our offensive linemen sprint down there and I then they celebrate and I start celebrating. And so when I look back on it, it was probably the best ball of my career. Uh, and I saved it for probably the best time in my career because I didn't know how tight that window was when I was throwing it. I just saw the spot and I threw it. And then there's a great camera angle in the back uh, where you can kind of see just how close the defender was. And that's a that was an all-star DB all year, played really great and literally had to put it in the right spot at the right time. And, and fortunately for me, uh, I saved my best throw for the biggest game, for the biggest play uh, in my career. Love it. Love it. I'm going a little off script here, but you mentioned your wife. Did your wife like the playoff stash? <laughs> it's so funny because it grew like uh, she like started to like it. At first she hated it. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like, you know, I get it. You have to do it, but I can't wait for the season to be over so you can, uh, you know, shave it. So we win that first game and uh, and she's like, you know, you know, it's not bad, but uh, it got you what you did, but I still am not a fan of it. And then we beat the Argos and she's like, okay uh going into the great cup and she's like all right like this mustache thing might be you might be onto something i'm kind of growing a little bit fond to it and then we win the great cup and she's like you can keep the mustache as long as you want <laughs> <laughs> and i was and i was like wow how the tables have turned and she's just like so maybe you know maybe the mustache had some juice and uh as it went on you know as we won more games and won more games she was more and more committed to the mustache but for me, after the parade, I, I shaved it um, because I felt like it was one of those things where I was kind of an end of an era. Like once that great cup was over, that celebration was over, it needs to go with it. Uh, and then especially knowing heading into 2024, I wasn't going to rock the mustache. Now, the biggest question is uh, when we make the playoffs this year, is the mustache coming back? And I know I'm going to get a lot of questions about that. And I, I think it has to. Uh, but I, I think uh, what the fans need to understand is – there was a lot of guys on the team that grew their mustaches as well. Not just me. Like, I feel like I took a lot of credit because I was in the media and I talked about it and I was kind of the, the guy who convinced a lot of these guys, but there was a lot of guys in the locker room, offensively, defensively, special teams, guys, some coaches that had mustaches. And it just goes to speak of the culture. Like guys were bought in and, whatever it takes to win a great cup is what that locker room was willing to do. Some guys had some gross mustaches and they wrote it out for the entire playoffs. And now I think we're all believers in the mustaches. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And then just quick, one of the, one of the instrumental pieces in the great cup win that we, we really haven't spoke about 
um, and he was instrumental through the whole year, was Austin Mack. Um, he's obviously not expected to be back in Montreal in 2024. Um, you know, being in the CFL and playing the way he did, it, it was inevitable, right? That he was uh, he was going to get his shot. Um, and Shane and I have this 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 tough balance of being so happy for them because obviously we know the NFL is the dream. Um, but how do you, as a quarterback, balance being happy for the guy and you know being disappointed that such a crucial part of the offense isn't going to be there next year? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I I told him selfishly, I'm very very mad at you, but <laughs> as a fan and as your friend, I love you and I'm so proud of you because what Austin Mack did is not easily done. To come into the CFL as a rookie, to understand the game and all the intricacies that it is, to be a thousand yard receiver, to be an all star. Uh, to do that all in year one with Coach Moss's offense, which is, in my opinion, the hardest offense in the CFL, the hardest playbook to learn. Um, he came in and he was nothing but the most professional player I've ever been around. And I, it's funny, when we talked in the beginning of the year, first off, he was a four stringer when it came yeah. to camp. And I give him crap about that all the time. I'm like, dude, you're some four stringer. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> um, but uh we, we were talking, we were watching film early on. I, I want to say it was either training camp or maybe week one, week two. And he asked me who my favorite or who my, the best receiver I ever played with was. Uh, and one of the guys I, I mentioned was Amari Cooper because I was with him with the Raiders and uh, he was pretty damn good. And he's like, well, at the end of this year, you're going to be saying Austin Mack. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, damn, this rookie's got some confidence. Uh, and sure enough, I texted him after the year. I said, you know what? When people ask me that question, who is the best receiver I've ever played with? First name that's going to come to mind is Austin Mack. And uh, that just goes to show of his demeanor, his confidence in himself, but also his humble approach. Like he came in humbled. And a lot of times you get these NFL guys who come to the CFL and just be like, I'm going to tear this league up. I'm an NFL guy. You know, I'm going back to the league in one year. And then they get up to the CFL, they see how good and talented these players are. And they're like, oh, shoot. And some guys don't even make it through training camp. And so for him to be able to do what he did uh, and just to be where his feet were, that's the best way to get back to the NFL. If you're a guy in your mid twenties um, is to be where your feet are, enjoy the process. And I know he loved Montreal, the city. He loved the fan base. He loved us players and he loved the CFL. And so whatever happens in the NFL, I hope he has a 10 year career, but I do know if uh, things don't pan out, I know Montreal would be the number one spot for him to come back. And as a player, as a quarterback, that makes me feel good moving forward. But uh, I want him to spend as much time as he can in the NFL so he can make that money because he deserves, you know, all the money in the world and, and he deserves it just the way he's worked. Yeah. And now moving on to the rest of the team, uh, kind of in the off season, there's a lot of work that needs to get done uh, by the GM and by the coaches. And it seems that Danny Mac has, has been working 24 hour days for <laughs> you know, since the, since the great cup happened and a lot of the guys extended and most guys actually extended. Um, so how exciting is it for you to run it back with all these guys that you just won the great cup with um, and potentially, you know, maybe turn Montreal into what Winnipeg was and, and go into the great cup for four years in a row. And that's it. That's exactly it. Four years in a row sounds so great. And, and that's just very hard to do. And what Winnipeg did was truly incredible. But the way they did it was keeping their core guys, their core guys and bringing back that continuity. And I think Danny and Coach Moss understand that and they want that. And usually and, and I've been a part of a great cup team in 2017 in Toronto. And uh, you usually see guys leave because they demand more money. Or, you know, other teams are just trying to poach them because they have more money, because they have more salary cap. And it's hard to retain everybody. And I know we're not going to be able to retain everybody. But what Danny has done so far is he's brought back a lot of our core guys. There's a couple core guys that uh, still haven't been signed. But it comes to free agency and, and guys want to see what they're worth and see what's out there. Um, but the grass always isn't greener on the other side. And I think guys need to understand. But you have to do yourself the due diligence to go out there and see that opportunity from the, the other teams. But what I'll say about uh, the guys we've signed back, the first thing I, I do is I reach out to whatever guy we signed back, I reach out to him and I said, we are gonna run it back and you're a huge part of this team because a lot of these guys are. Um, you know, I, I even think about a guy like uh, Najee Murray who uh, was with us in Boy. the beginning of the year and played outstanding. And then he was hurt the rest of the year. And I think kind of went unforgotten on a team that wins a great cup. 
but a guy that has tremendous talent, a great core guy, a, a locker room guy that everybody loves. You know, it's it's guys like that that um, you get you see him re-signed and you're like, I want to see a full year of Mr. Murray. So that's like the, the biggest thing for me. And like I said, as a fan, like I don't have this inside scoop. You know, Danny will call me and ask me about a couple of players in free agency or ask me about a couple of players on our team. And, you know, I'll give them my two cents. But that's about it for me. I'm, it's not like I have this great poll where I can be like, hey, we need to sign this guy. And it's funny when you win a great cup, there's a lot of people that want to be a part of that culture. And so the amount of texts I've received from players that I've played with in the past that are like, Hey man, I'm willing to do anything, you know, to come and play in the nest. You guys have a great culture there. And so I think we'll be a highly sought after team in free agency. It's just, I, I just wonder how active we will be because I feel like we have a lot of our pieces already in place. Uh, and there's a couple pieces, obviously we still need, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see how this team takes form and takes shape uh, in free agency. And now I can sit back, eat some popcorn and just watch all the drama unfold as opposed to being part of that drama. <laughs> yeah. And I got one last question more centered around you. Uh, last year, we said it was about uh, exactly this time last year, give or take a couple of weeks. You signed in Montreal, said it wasn't a rebuilding year, proved it wasn't, then told all the doubters, which I recently found out you're not a big swearer, but I'm going to swear for you, told the doubters <laughs> to fuck off, brought a cup back to the city hey. and, won, <laughs> and won MVP and then signed an extension. So what should we expect of year two uh, in the Cody Fajardo era? consistency that's that's the main goal if you want to be the best in an elite quarterback in the cfl you need consistency and so i felt like over the course of my career i've had can some consistent years in terms of numbers but being able to win football games and win great cups that's what i want to do i want to be the most consistent quarterback that i can be for this club uh and i want to just be a leader a guy for this locker room that you know i'm not a big vocal guy i know my my speech came out and everyone probably thinks i'm this big rah-rah guy and that's once in a blue moon and i've already told the guys you know after the game i said look don't expect that speech every single game we get to another great cup maybe i got something special for you but I'm not a big talker. I'm, I'm not a big cursor as well. But uh, I think what I really, the, the way I take my leadership is um, by just understanding guys and getting to know their backgrounds and just getting close to them uh, outside of football, spending time with them, you know, in the locker room and just uh, just being there for them because I've been blessed to play going on my ninth year, nine years of professional football. And a lot of the guys on our team were in our, their first or second year. And so giving them any experience or knowledge that I can give them and I haven't done everything the right way. And I've learned through some of the dumb decisions I've made. And so hopefully I can help them uh, in that. And what's been really cool for me is uh, behind closed doors, I have had a lot of young quarterbacks reach out to me and we have had some great conversations on other teams, you know, uh, uh, not just on our team, on other teams about just things in terms of how I study, how I work out in the off season, how I manage my money. Like I'm so open to that for the young guys, because I remember when I signed to the CFL and Ricky Ray took me under my wing, I wouldn't be where I'm at without a guy like that. I wouldn't be where I'm at without a guy like Travis Ule. And so I got to pay it forward to these guys. And it's always great to have that respect from your peers and guys you compete against and just know that uh, they respect you as a quarterback. So, uh, but to answer your question, consistency, that's what I want to do. And, and in 2017, when we won the great cup, I signed to BC the next year. So I wasn't a part of the banner reveal. I wasn't part of the great cup ring ceremony. And so these will all be first for me. And I think it'll be very exciting for me and my family uh, and for my career, just to be a part of those. And I can't wait for our home opener uh, against Ottawa to have that banner reveal. I think the fans are going to be excited. There's been a lot of Montreal Alouettes talk throughout the off season, uh, rightfully so. And, and that's what we want to do. We want to make it a hostile style environment and you guys and your podcast do a great job of getting that out there to the fans and so uh it's been really cool just to be a small part of your guys's podcast uh, and, and thanks for for having me kind of on the show absolutely yeah just wrapping it up here cody um we're not gonna say you're the official good luck charm for the alouettes just yet <laughs> because you know shane and i have been doing this for one year and we've won one great cup so it might be us but um it's I a candom I mean thing i think I I think, I, that's what I was going to say. I think we might have to do this every year and, and guarantee <laughs> success. But um, I think I speak for everyone in Montreal for obviously, hey, thanks for the great cup. And uh, thanks for everything you do for the city. Thanks for everything you're going to continue to do for the city. And then on a selfish note, thank you so much for coming on with us. You know, you, you don't have to do that. And we we appreciate that so much.
it's always a great time. And the Grey Cup is back where it belongs. It's back home. And now we got to keep it home and we got to defend it uh, being at our home place. And so Absolutely. we're going to need the fans to back us uh, throughout the year and to show up and show out for us. And I'm just excited for this 2024 season. I think the sky's the limit with the guys we've retained. And I think the guys we're going to go after in free agency, this team is going to be something that uh, this province is going to be very proud of. Absolutely. Hey, thanks so much, Cody. We will see you uh, at that home opener against Ottawa, Percival Molson, and uh, we'll see all you fans there too. Absolutely. Thanks guys.